Hello, and welcome to this Fair Living Teal Global Summit panel, Transitions, How to Prepare Your Child to Transition from K through 12 and Beyond. My name is Hillary Carter. I am a food allergy mama, advocate, and proud member of FAIR's Board of Governors. Thank you for joining us. I know that when my two boys were both diagnosed with a long list of life-threatening food allergies, one of the very first thoughts I had was, how are we going to manage school? So many important aspects to consider and so many important milestones along the way. Thankfully, today we have three veteran food allergy moms here to share their experiences. Talia Day, Kay Cole, and Denise Bunning will walk us through their experiences and give their advice for the transitions all the way through. So we have a very information packed session for you today. Jot down any notes you have or questions you want to ask, and I'll be back at the end to moderate a Q&A. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Talia Day. I'm a member of the FAIR Board of Governors. I am also a food allergy mom and advocate. I am excited to talk to you about how to prepare your child for transitions, and I'm going to focus on the earlier years, where I'll actually even talk about earlier than kindergarten, and up through elementary. As you can see, I have three children, all with varying food allergies, so I have a lot of experience preparing them in the early years. And the early years are difficult. Your child is still not advocating for themselves. They can't read food allergy labels. They really are relying mainly on others still to manage their food allergies on caregivers. But there are things we can do to help prepare our, our children to take on some of the responsibility themselves. Uh, but we're also going to discuss how to best prepare the world for our children to help make it safe for them. So some of the milestones they're gonna be hitting around these ages is they're gonna be starting school they're going to be starting to go to more birthday parties or after school activities, drop off play dates and sleepovers. And as a food allergy parent, you need to think about all of these really carefully and how do you minimize the risk? How do you plan ahead to minimize the risk? And then what are your action plans in case something happens? So we're going to start with how to help your child themselves to take on some of the responsibility. So one of the best things you can do is teach your child to speak up to their teachers, their caregivers, their coaches, to make sure that those caregivers remember that they have food allergies. So can you teach them to say, is this safe for me? Are you sure I'm not allergic? Uh, did my mommy or daddy say I could eat this? All those things help trigger in the other person's mind that they better be careful with your child. So while as a parent, we're probably thinking about their food allergies 24 seven, um, someone else may not be, especially if they have a whole class of children and other children have different issues. So can your child um, say something to help remind them that they better pay special attention? I also found ID bracelets or EpiPen tags for the, for the backpack really helpful. These are easily found pretty much anywhere. And then lastly, to help prepare your child for these transitions, I found picture books at this age about allergies really helpful. It helped normalize having allergies by seeing other characters in similar situations to them. And I listed here a few of my favorites, uh, but there are others and many of them are really wonderful at helping teach your children about how to speak up for their food allergies. So how do we prepare the world for your child? Well, we need to minimize the risk of allergen exposure. So first starting with school. If you have an airborne allergen, 
you need to talk to your school about whether that allergen is going to be allowed at all in your child's classroom. So I have a nut-free school, so I don't have to worry about that. But others may need to have that difficult discussion. So if it is not an airborne allergen, there are other things that you still need to consider, such as lunches and snacks. So for instance, my middle son is allergic to eggs and dairy, but other kids were still allowed to bring that in their lunches. So we talked to the teachers about how were they going to do seating for the children and supervision to make sure that kids weren't touching my son's lunch and that he was never going to touch someone else's lunch. Where would his lunch be kept so that it never got confused with someone else's lunch? Because I swear if they handed him a different lunchbox at that age, he wouldn't have looked twice. He would have opened it up and been fine eating someone else's lunch. And then we also made sure he had a personal tray so that it helped keep his food separate from other children's food. We also discussed in school birthday celebrations, holiday celebrations, and special treats. Does your school give something out? Do you need to keep something in class if those treats aren't going to be safe for your child? For instance, we gave the teacher a bag of treats that they could just pull one out every time they needed something special for our child. Next, you could discuss science and art experiments. And I, that sounds funny, but in our circumstance, we needed to make sure that they weren't using recycled milk containers or recycled egg cartons that they often use for art projects. I've also seen them use flour to make Play-Doh or cornstarch for slime. So you really want to make sure that the entire environment is going to be safe for your child not just during mealtimes, and that the teacher really understands that and thinks about your child from every angle. And then there's sanitation protocols. So hand wiping, obviously, um, but also are they going to clean under and around tables after the children have eaten to make sure your child isn't playing on the floor next to something that isn't safe for them? Um, and then just some other things to talk about would be field trips, outside food brought into the room during other times. And then this one's important, substitute teachers. You have these discussions with your teachers and a substitute comes in. Will they be informed of the protocols that you've set up and do they know about your child's allergies? So you need to know who the substitute would be and who would be informing them to make sure that even on those days your child is kept safe. So of course we do everything we can to minimize risk, but there always is the chance of something happening and you need to be prepared. So here's an example of an allergy action plan. I downloaded this format from the FAIR website and have adjusted it for my children. You can also take one from the FAIR website, or I'm sure your doctor can help you. You're welcome to take this slide and adjust it as well. But it's important that you review it with your school nurse or teacher so that they really understand when to react for your child and how to keep them safe. And then lastly, and this is for school or after school programs, sports programs, know the safety protocols, discuss where EpiPens will be kept and who will have access to them. Do EpiPens need to travel with your child or do they get kept in the nurse's office, for instance? Just make sure everyone is on the same page and you feel comfortable with uh, what the protocol is. So at this age, it's not just transitioning to school, but you're transitioning to possible drop-off play dates, birthday parties, after-school activities. You need to know who will be in charge of your child, and do they know how to use EpiPens or where these EpiPens are kept? Those are important questions. I used to send out a you know, five-minute YouTube video to anyone who watched my children that was an EpiPen training video and symptoms to look for. 
just make sure whoever is watching your child is equipped to deal with the allergies. And then it's equally important that your child knows who they should talk to if they don't feel well. So you can't just drop off at a birthday party and say bye to Jimmy and then hand the EpiPens over. You need to make sure that your child knows who they are going to talk to if they don't feel well and that that person has mommy or daddy's number and will get in touch with you if they need to. And then plan in advance. Talk to parents beforehand or coaches beforehand. Know if food is going to be served, if it will be safe. And I always like to bring a a treat or something, even if I think it will be safe, Uh, wrap something, I can always use it later. But just in case I get there and then don't feel comfortable. And lastly, I'm just going to end with saying that parents need to stay calm and talk openly to others and your child about their allergies. Um, It models good behavior for your children and it helps them know that this is normal, this is nothing to be ashamed of, and that they can advocate for themselves. And that when they see you advocating for them and talking openly to people about how to minimize the risk and staying calm about it, it helps keep them calm also, and it will help them develop as they get older to advocate for themselves. So I'm going to end there and pass it off. Hope that was helpful. Thanks. My name is Kay Cole, and I'm going to share with you my experiences regarding transitioning from elementary school to middle. This is my family. My husband, Colin, and I have shellfish allergies. Our son, Colin Jr. and Cassius have no food allergies, nor does our dog, Cleopatra. My daughter, Karis, on the other hand, she has nine food allergies. She's 11 years old and is a newly minted sixth grader. She's a competitive dancer, TikTok connoisseur, lover of all things sparkly, and the Green Bay Packers. She's the reason why I'm here. There are so many things that I loved about our school community, but these three aspects were ones that imbued us with the confidence to allow Karis to find her way. Um, What I especially loved about our school was the availability of leadership opportunities for students at every grade level. I knew right away that this was an opportunity for Karis to gain the confidence and skill set she would need throughout her academic journey. So here's my disclaimer. I'm still learning. So my goal is to share with you what has worked for us and how confidence building has played an enormous role in our transitioning process. And the truth is, we're at the very early stages of finding our way. Three of these four questions have served as a guidepost for us year after year, grade after grade. The final question, of course, is the wild card. So how did I know when she was ready? What signs did she show? Um, First things first, uh, transitioning um, is an ongoing process where learning and growth are taking place after every stage or at every stage. Um, Think about it as a cumulative series of steps, grade to grade, year after year. Once we start viewing transitioning using this lens, planning, became easier for us. Um, It was no longer a goal that we were trying to reach. Um, It was more about keeping our daughter safe, but yet giving her the necessary tools to take care of herself as she got older. Um, Once we started looking at things from that mindset, we began our mission on teaching her how to advocate for herself. And by second grade, she she was well on her way of doing that. Um, she started carrying her rescue medications, although she couldn't self-administer, but allowing her to be a part of that day-to-day process empowered her. So when we would go places, people would say, what's in your knapsack? And she would proudly share with them what, what, what it contained, which were, I don't know, uh, a scrunchie of some sort, um, a toy here and there, her rescue medications and of course, wet wipes. 
So self-disclosure, no or no. Um, during her younger years, my husband and I would disclose Karis' food allergies, but as she got older, we start, we just passed that responsibility to her. And we allowed her to identify key people that she believed needed to know about her food allergies. And the food allergies were starting to become hers and not ours, even though we had a shared sense of responsibility. Uh, did you wipe? Okay, it's not what you think, but this was a sign that we knew she was on her way to being ready. Um, normally, you know, us in the food allergy community, we're wiping everything down. Um, and, and that's usually my responsibility or my husband's, but when we start taking her out to eat, we would notice that she would pull out her own wipes and she would start wiping things down without even being asked. So, you know, as small as it seemed, it was huge for us. Um, so yes, did you wipe? No is a sentence. I repeat, no is a sentence. There have been plenty of times when Karis has been offered food and she would look for me, look to me for confirmation of whether she could have those foods or not. And now she no longer does that. She simply says, no, thank you. Who's in your squad? For us, it's been a wide range of people. And now that we're in middle school, we're in the process of, of learning the ropes and finding those people. And because we aren't attending school full time, we're learning to make provisions. How do we lay the groundwork for success? As I mentioned earlier, confidence building was going to be a major factor for us. Uh, food allergies are just one layer. Another layer is our ethnicity. And for us, you know, it is about having those conversations, not only with Karis, but with our other children about what that means for them. And so with Karis, with food allergies, what we know about food allergies is that that could be a very lonely place for, for anyone. And especially while you're trying to find your way, going from elementary school to middle school and from middle school to high school. And one of the pressing questions that we had was how do we get her ahead while simultaneously addressing the other layers? Um, so one of the goals for us was to help her to, to develop a sense of self that counters prevailing stereotypes and negative messages about her race and her food allergies. And it has been about teaching her how to speak up and speak out when she feels slighted, unheard, and mistreated. And so getting her involved with the Teal Pumpkin Project has been incredible. Um, we started that when she was in kindergarten as a Girl Scout and she was in Girl Scout. I happened to be her troop leader. And so that was, that was just an amazing experience for us, um, seeking out leadership opportunities, volunteering at school and in the community. And ultimately it landed her in the fifth grade year on student council. Um, so giving her a sense of agency has also allowed her voice to get stronger and stronger each year. And the last thing I wanted to point out, point out was um, uh, ha having a seat at the table. That was key for us. Um, her third grade year, she wanted to stop sitting at the allergy table. We had to talk about it. We were nervous, but she convinced us that she could do it. And so her third grade year, she stopped sitting at the allergy table. And by her fifth grade year, she was sitting around the student council table, sharing her ideas about adding allergy friendly foods to the school wide food drive. So get them in leadership. Pandemic school and food allergies. We're all just, we're all just out here just doing our best for sure. But I will tell you that I felt a sense of relief and I welcomed the break from the struggles and worries about school and food allergies. Is she going to eat alone? Is she going to be accepted? Who is she going to disclose to? You know, those questions that we have year after year. Um, we've been using this time to teach important life skills. She now knows how to cook. Um, she's also been experimenting with new foods without feeling rushed. Um, we've been able to talk with the school more uh, 
deliberately about safety measures. And we've also had the opportunity to video conference with our family and friends more. So how are we managing the psychosocial components of transitioning? Well, we all know that food allergies can bring a whole host of, of feelings. Um, some of those can be anxiety, stress and worry, sadness, um, feelings of isolation, um, worries about fitting in and peer acceptance. And so some of the things that we've been working with Karis has been um, finding those opportunities for her to develop those leadership abilities, um, welcoming mistakes, um, letting her know and giving her permission to not be perfect all the time, um, giving her the responsibility of being in the driver's seat, which she loves, um, teaching her her elevator speech. And her elevator speech is simply her, her phrase, her, her little small spiel when we go out to eat because she orders her own food now. We allow her to do that. We only interject when necessary. Uh, and the other thing is teaching your child how to trust his or her gut. This has been a biggie for me, ingredient checks. Um, some of the things that I have, I've been able to manage is um, pinpointing what causes my anxiety, what exacerbates those anxieties, um, how much control am I willing to relinquish? Is this fight worth it? I'm gonna tell you right now, that has been the big one. Is this fight worth it? Is the fight at the birthday party worth it? Is the fight with the person who doesn't believe food allergies exist, is that worth it? When you start asking yourself those questions and pinpointing those triggers, you'll be able to manage stress a little bit better. Asking yourself, am I consuming a balanced diet will, um, will bring surprising um, revelations to you. Um, some of the things that were a concern for me were, were, were um, am I striking a balance between what I can control and what I can't? Uh, what am I unnecessarily consuming? Is it too much social media banter? Is it, you know, it, it, is it a post somebody wrote again about um, peanut butter? I don't know, but some of those things you have to learn how to manage. So resources beyond fair. As my daughter became more independent, we needed to have the ability to reach her and a cell phone was the answer. It's a process, y'all. <laughs> so, but it's it's been working. Um, I have to say it's been working. Um, look to social media accounts that are food allergy specific. Um, they have been a tremendous help when looking for answers, recipes, and just looking for the latest updates. Establish the crew who gets it and look for your local network of food allergy families. This has been a saving grace for us. You're never alone. And although it may feel like it, people are just a phone call away. So what's next? Homework, of course. Ask, ask, ask. Remember, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. If you don't ask, you'll never get what you need. Be prepared. Practice using your voice. Find your tribe. Find the gift in food allergies. You'll be surprised what's there. Um, get involved with local organization and explore various aspects of your identity. You are not your food allergies. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Denise Bunning, and I'm part of the FAIR Board of Governors. I'm going to go very quickly as I only have about eight minutes. I'm thrilled to be on this panel. I love sharing our family's experiences in hopes that these tips and tricks will allow your family to have easier transitions. I have two sons, Brian, who's 26, and tree nut allergic, has mild asthma and environmental allergies, and Daniel, who's 24, and is milk, tree nut, shellfish, and fish allergic, has eosinophilic esophagitis, and also has environmental allergies. More details on each of them in a bit. My approach is always to educate in a positive and fun way. Since you have already heard about the other stages, I will be focusing on high school, 
college, and beyond. Struggling as a pupa, or what I call high school parents, POFAs, parents of food allergic high schoolers. Lots of milestones and activities, including social media, extracurricular activities, significant birthdays, dating, and choosing a college. Brian was a swimmer in high school and college. He also played saxophone in high school and was very focused on his math and science classes. He also was a serious gamer, which caused some friction with his dad. Daniel played soccer and sang in high school and in college. He has a very competitive personality and wanted to do well in everything. He would often run out of time, but has gotten better with his time management. Communication plan. Call, text, email, social media, bitmoji and emojis. Disclaimer, I do not use social media. I don't have a Facebook page, but I've heard from several people that it may be helpful. I'm old school. I like to call, text, and email, but I like to do it with my personality so my boys feel like they're really talking to mom. Discuss with your child how you will continue to stay in touch. Having a communication plan will help relieve your anxiety. Prior to heading to college, Daniel participated in an oral immunotherapy trial to milk, as well as other, a few other anaphylactic allergies. He is now desensitized to milk. This was a game changer for him. Becoming a butterfly, college milestones, moving to college, dating, internships, turning 21, and your career. These are the years of yes. You want your child to have as many safe opportunities as possible. So if they're asking and wanting to do something, then in my opinion, it's up to us as parents to make it happen. Almost everything can be adapted. You just have to be willing to find a way to make it safe. Doesn't mean you may bring your own food. Does it mean making sure you have a microwave refrigerator? Does it mean you skip one part of something? Does it mean relying on your 504 for extra accommodations? Be creative and make memories. With family, it is possible. Brian swam in college and really enjoyed the University of Chicago and majoring in biology with a specialization in immunology. His freshman and sophomore years, he was able to live in a dorm with a microwave and a refrigerator. His junior and senior years, he opted for a very gross but convenient to campus apartment. Despite his allergies, Brian was able to participate in a college sport, a fraternity, find a girlfriend, and oh yeah, attend classes. Daniel went to Northwestern and majored in economics and musical theater. Freshman year, Daniel opted for a single dorm room with a bathroom and a microwave refrigerator in his dorm. Sophomore year, he decided to follow in his brother's footstep and lived in a gross apartment with one roommate. Junior year, he lived in a fairly okay house with seven other acapella guys. Senior year, he lived in a very small one bedroom apartment. Despite Daniel's allergies, he was able to sing an acapella group, perform in musicals, participate in a fraternity, has not yet found a girlfriend, and yes, go to classes too. Dating, everyone wants to know, but how will my food allergic child date? Let me tell you, if there's a will, there's a way. I asked my sons if they had advice to share. I asked them, did you tell your girlfriend right away about your food allergies? Here's what one of them said. So I talked about it on my first date, but didn't go into specific detail on how severe it was until a little bit later. She understood it was severe, but the graphic detail wasn't needed. Then I asked the girlfriend, once he told you about his severe allergies, what did you do? She said, I think I knew about the allergies casually from being on the swim team, but I think he told me pretty early about the severity. I was pretty nervous about it at first, probably asked a lot of questions. On our first couple of dates, I asked was nervous about whether or not the food I ordered was okay for him to eat or even be around. I get less nervous now, but was pretty terrified in the beginning. 
One time I ate trail mix right before seeing him and was frantically Googling research and brushing my teeth. A few months in, he taught me how to use the EpiPen and the AviQ, and now I only occasionally have to ask about what to avoid at a restaurant. And then I asked my sons, any hints or suggestions for this group? Reminder, parents are really nervous about their 13 to 21 year olds. They said, allergies in general is a go-to conversation starter if you run out of legitimate things to talk about, but should not be your first move. Birthdays and turning 21, everyone loves cupcakes. Turning 21 brings a whole new level of excitement, yet being careful about alcohol. Making sure you know what is in your drink is imperative. One food allergic 21 year old recommends avoid mystery drinks. Research the alcohols that you may or may not be allergic to before going out and then stick with simple drinks that don't require a lot of ingredients. One also said, I advise pouring your own drinks and sticking with things you know. Also, one student's voice of experience noted, Benadryl has a bad reaction when mixed with alcohol. It took a lot of time, but Daniel stayed safely in Beijing, China for 10 weeks. That's 72 days. Yep, I was counting. He had a micro fridge in his dorm, and we shipped his eosinophilic esophagitis formula and medicine a month before he arrived. We even got to visit him. He turned 20 when he was there. Daniel interned in San Francisco during his sophomore and junior summers. He started working remotely as an analyst for a bank in Chicago. Brian lived in a house with four other working friends and also an apartment. He worked at Stanford as a research assistant in an allergy lab. Now he's at Columbia in New York, getting a master's in biostatistics, combining his love of science, math, and computers. I remember sitting at Ferris Teen Summit, listening to the mom of a college freshman, and I thought to myself, are you kidding me? I'm having a hard time getting through seventh grade. How am I gonna do that? Here's what I can tell you from my humble experience as the mom of two food allergic young adults. You will listen to your kids. They will push and ask you to help them do something if it's important to them. They will tell you they don't care about something. Sometimes the I don't care needs further investigation on your part. They may really want to do something, but it seems too overwhelming for them. Be involved, get engaged. I'm preaching to the choir here because here you are listening. I always include our extended family in these discussions because this process requires a team effort. Lean on the people who, listen to you and your child, encourage you when you're frustrated, remain involved in your child's life because that's what this is all about, your child's life. Starting my MOCA support group in 1997 was one of the greatest ways to meet some fascinating, smart, collaborative, and creative people. I'm thrilled to be on the board of FAIR. My husband, Dave, is working hard as chairman of the board to raise money and take FAIR to the next level in every regard, along with our fantastic CEO, Lisa Gable. He welcomes your input and ideas, as does she. You can do this. I'm happy to be one of your go-to people. I'm in this 24 seven until there's no longer a need. Feel free to contact me at denise at mochaallergies.org. And now we're gonna open it up for some Q and A. Thanks so much. I hope you learned a lot. Take care.